Hello, and welcome to part 4 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. We have finally made it down to layer 2 of this humongous iceberg. I expect these mysteries to be a little more obscure than the ones we recently went over, so let's take a shot and dive on in. 2007 Siberian Orange Snow In January 2007, an orange, and sometimes described red or yellow, tinted snow would begin to fall on the Omsk Oblast of Siberia. The rotten smelling oily substance was reported across a 580 square mile area. When the snow was studied, it was discovered that it contained four times the normal level of iron, acids, and nitrates. The area that it affected was home to about 27,000 residents. The mystery into what caused the orange snow would be debated, and no one is for sure what caused it. But environmental watchdogs speculated that it was caused by industrial pollution, specifically from a metallurgical plant. But there are various industrial plants in the area, so if it was chemical related, it would be almost impossible to pinpoint. Others have cited a rocket launch in Kazakhstan, which would eventually be ruled out. Of course the biggest fear to many was the possibility that it could have been a nuclear accident. Fears would be set aside though when it was later determined that the snow was non-toxic, but people were still advised not to use the snow or to allow animals to eat it. Finally, the most likely theory would come about. It was just possible that it was actually caused by a heavy sandstorm in neighboring Kazakhstan. In fact, a test would reveal that the snow had several sand and clay dust particles, which were blown up into the Russian stratosphere. However, some have claimed this is a Russian cover-up for some sort of accident or pollution, so we still can't be sure. Abduction of Violet Ripken On the morning of July 24, 2012, in Baltimore, Maryland, a 74-year-old woman named Violet Ripken would enter her garage only to be greeted by a strange sight. A man was waiting on her, wearing a ski mask and gloves holding a handgun. He directed her to get into her own vehicle, a silver 1998 Lincoln Town Car. He would then blindfold her and bound her ankles and wrists with rope. She would plead with him not to put her in the trunk due to her claustrophobia. The man would give in and move her to the back seat. He then put duct tape over her glasses and drove away. He did not say where they were going or what they were doing. He would eventually pull over and put a t-shirt on the driver's side rear window to hide Violet better. He would then make multiple stops for gas and food. He wasn't mean to the lady, and he kept reassuring her that he wasn't going to harm her. He even shared fast food with her. What made this case even stranger, though, was Violet was fairly famous in the Baltimore area. She was of baseball royalty. Her husband had been a coach in Major League Baseball for decades. One of her sons was a legend, and broke the all-time streak for consecutive games played while her other son also had a stint in the majors. She was beloved in the city as well as by sports fans alike. And despite that fame, the man seemed to have no idea who she was. It seemed she was not targeted for a ransom. Since she had lived alone, it would take her family more than 12 hours to realize she had been abducted, and around 8.30 that night, they would call the police and report her missing. Meanwhile, about 30 minutes prior, at 8 p.m., a couple in White Marsh, Maryland would see a silver sedan parked on the pull-off area near a highway. They saw one man standing on the outside of the car, walking around wearing gloves, which was unusual because it was about 90 degrees that day, and an older woman in the back of the car. The woman appeared to be wearing a mask. The witnesses also noticed a shirt or a sheet that covered the driver's side rear window. The couple obviously knew something was off, and they approached the man. He told them, quote, that's my mother. She has Alzheimer's, end quote. Within moments, he got back into the car, peeled out, and left. Luckily, the fast-thinking couple were able to write down the license plate number. It was registered to Violet's now-deceased husband. Police would do a welfare check while all this was going on and discover both Violet and her vehicle was missing while her cell phone remained at home. They would search around the home and neighborhood, but they found no sign of Violet. But one neighbor would tell investigators a few days prior an unknown man was going back and forth down the street in a pickup truck. Police were now certain that it was an abduction and issued a public plea for help the following morning. That morning, just 45 minutes after the public plea, a man coming home from work would drive by an older lady sitting in her silver sedan, waving a sweatshirt out the window and blowing the horn. The man called in the suspicious sight and police responded and found Violet unharmed. It turned out the abductor had brought her back to the neighborhood before abandoning the vehicle. He was only a block from her home. To this day, the man has never been identified. Furthermore, detectives aren't even sure of a motive. There was no ransom. Violet was unharmed. 
He did use her credit cards to buy a few items. It's thought that maybe he got scared once he realized she was a beloved figure in Baltimore. But police doubt this, as it would have made him more likely to ask for a ransom. One of the more out there theories was that Cal Ripken Jr. just paid the ransom off, but police told him to keep quiet about it because it could encourage others to attempt to do it again. And in spite of the $100,000 reward and multiple videos of the man, he has never been identified. Ada Constance Kent Ada Constance Kent was a retired British actress that appeared in both stage and film productions. She worked for many years in London before settling down in the English countryside. It is here that she would move into a cottage near an area called Wellbone Corner. The 66-year-old was unmarried and living alone. She had a reputation for being a bit of a recluse. In the summer of 1939, a friend of Ada's would go visit her. When she arrived, however, Ada did not come to the door. Her friend would start to worry and contact the Kent police, as her friend stated that she had not seen her in three months, which was unusual even for Ada. Officer Bernard Constable would be dispatched to the cottage with another unnamed officer. The press recorded of the events, quote, The door to the cottage was found unlocked. A supper tray with the remains of a meal was resting atop the dining table. A copy of Romeo and Juliet was found open in a chair near the fireplace. Her coat was still on the hook, end quote. More officers would arrive and search the area and found nothing. After a more thorough investigation, detectives found out that she was last seen by Alfred J. Hassler nearly three months earlier, on March 6th. He said she looked very ill and was coughing badly. With no other leads or clues, the case would quickly go cold. It would be another 10 years before detectives would get a new lead, when in March 1949, a bank would contact the police stating that someone had been making a number of large deposits into Ada's account. The last deposit was made as late as September 1948. Detectives wondered if it was possible that Ada had come back after all this time, so they went out to her home to check again. But they didn't find her. Instead, they found a fully clothed skeleton positioned next to the bed. Next to the skeleton was an empty bottle marked, Poison. The cottage itself looked the same as when police visited a decade ago, minus the dust. They were able to rule out robbery since Ada's jewels and money still lay around. However, the Romeo and Juliet book was missing. Inspectors had no idea who could have placed the skeleton there. Furthermore, after Scotland Yard was brought in, they determined the body was not even Ada, and more likely it was that of a man. In spite of the bottle labeled poison that was set in the room, the autopsy was able to rule out poisoning, as well as strangulation. But other than that, they had no idea how the person had died. It is a very bizarre mystery to say the least, but there is at least one good theory that provides somewhat of an answer. That is, Ada left on her own. She was in bad health. It's possible she tried to make her way to a local hospital and got lost in the countryside somewhere and died, and her body was never found. Or, it's possible that she decided to just leave on her own accord and maybe go live out her life with a relative and swore that person to secrecy, since she was such a recluse. Once news got out about her disappearance, someone else needed to dispose of a body and realized the cottage hadn't been touched in forever and would be the perfect spot. He would have then set the poison bottle out to make others think that Ada had came back to commit suicide. He may have even stolen the Romeo and Juliet book. It isn't a definite answer, but it makes a lot of sense. Agent 355 Agent 355 was a code name allegedly used by a female spy during the American Revolution. She was one of the first spies in American history, yet her identity is still unknown to this day. She was part of the Culpa Ring, which is the network that was formed in 1778 to help fight against British occupation. In fact, the only direct reference to her is in one of the Culpa Ring letters that was sent from Abraham Woodhull to George Washington, in which he describes her as, quote, one who that been ever serviceable to this correspondence, end quote. Although we still don't know who she is, there are a few things we know. She was likely recruited by Woodhull himself. The code seems to indicate she had some degree of social prominence, most likely a member of a prominent loyalist family. She likely lived in New York City. She also had contact with Benedict Arnold, as well as having a connection to other British commanders, and probably reported on their activities. There are a few guesses to whom she may have been as well. One was that it may have been Woodhull's neighbor Anna Strong, who allegedly helped the Culper Ring in some capacity. Another thought was that she may have been the wife of Robert Townsend, who was also a spy, as it was mentioned that Townsend was in love with Agent 355. But it's also possible that it could have been Sarah Townsend, 
who was the sister of Robert Townsend. She was thought to be an informant that reported directly to Washington. Another theory was that of Elizabeth Bergen, who was contacted by the Culper Ring in 1779, and she agreed to help Yankee prisoners escape the British prison ships. Another common belief is that there is no Agent 355 at all, but rather that was a code name for some woman who had useful information, but not technically a spy, just someone that helped out now and again. The most famous claim about Agent 355, though, is that she is thought to have played a crucial role in exposing Benedict Arnold for his betrayal to the U.S., and legend has it that it's because of this that a pregnant Agent 355 would be allegedly captured by the British and sentenced to the prison ship HMS Jersey. She would then give birth to a boy before dying on the ship. I say allegedly because some argue that women were not allowed to be imprisoned on any of the prison ships. This points more evidence toward Anna Strong being Agent 355 because she is known to have went to the HMS Jersey often to visit and feed her husband. It could be because she was spotted there often that a rumor got started that she was imprisoned there, and that became a legend. But unless some other documents come to light, we will most likely never know who Agent 355 really was. Alexandra Palace's wartime television demonstrations. The UK's BBC television service officially opened on November 2nd, 1935. For its early years, it would be stationed at Alexandra Palace, where it sat on a hill, increasing its effectiveness at transmitting television across London and the surrounding counties. But as World War II started, the station would be shut down on September 1, 1939, with the rationale being that closing its doors prevented the Germans from exploiting the transmission signals from the palace and using them as a navigation aid. Although television service would not be fully restored until June 7, 1946, Alexandra Palace would host two private television demonstrations during the war. The second one occurred near the end of World War II in February 1945. It's well documented thanks to the efforts of the BBC Written Archive Center and the Alexander Palace Television Society. The transmission lasted 40 minutes. Based on the surviving photos, we know that several celebrities made an appearance, such as Phyllis Calvert, American singer Evelyn Daw, and Canadian comedian Robert Goodyear. The demonstration concluded with the play of Julius Caesar. However, what makes this a lost media mystery is, as I mentioned before, there were two of these made. The first one was in August 1943, Unlike the well-documented one in 1945, hardly anything was recorded about the one in 1943. There's not even any records in the BBC Written Archive Center or the Public Records Office. The only reason we know anything about it is because of a few notes from the engineer Desmond Campbell and from Alexandra Palace Television Society archivist Simon Vaughn. There are a few photos of the event that show scenes being filmed. Additionally, an article from September 11, 1943 stated that the BBC engineers were called into the Alexandra Palace to conduct an important television picture for a private purpose. We still don't know what that purpose was, but it is believed that the demonstration could have been created for either Winston Churchill or King George. Like all early TV transmissions, the entirety of the event was televised live, and limited viable means of recording existed, with the videotape not becoming perfected until the late 1950s. So it's very likely that this 1943 demonstration is permanently missing. We will also most likely never even know what it was about. Alphabet Murders This is an unsolved series of child murders that occurred between 1971 and 1973 in Rochester, New York. All three of the victims were aged 10 or 11, and their surname began with the same letter as that of their first name. Each victim had also been sexually assaulted and then strangled to death before the body was discarded in a nearby town of Rochester, with the town name beginning with the same letter as the victim's name. The three victims were as follows, 10-year-old Carmen Colon, 11-year-old Wanda Walkowitz, and 11-year-old Michelle Mianza. Carmen disappeared on November 16th while returning home from running an errand. She was sent to the pharmacy by her grandmother to pick up a prescription. But when she learned that it had not been processed, she told the store owner, quote, I got to go, I got to go, end quote, and then entered a car close to the pharmacy. About 30 minutes later, at 5.10 p.m., Several motorists would report seeing the child on I-490. The child was nude from the waist down and running from what was believed to have been a dark-colored Ford Pinto that was moving in reverse. She was frantically waving her arms attempting to flag down a passing vehicle. No one stopped, and the girl was led back to the car by the suspect. Two days later, her body would be found 12 miles away in a culvert. The fact that no one stopped to help the girl would enrage citizens further. Almost a year and a half later, on April 2, 1973, Wanda Walkowitz would run an errand as well. 
She had went to a delicatessen to buy some groceries at 5.15 p.m. She would be reported missing three hours later when she failed to return home. Law enforcement responded swiftly and searched several square miles around her home and the delicatessen. All searches failed. Several residents did report they seen Wanda struggling to carry the bag of groceries, so it's known that she at least made it to the store. She was also observed bracing the bag against the fence so she can improve her grip on a brown vehicle past her. Her body would be found by police the next morning at 10.15 a.m. on a hillside, and it appeared that she was thrown from a moving vehicle. She had several defensive wounds. One witness stated that they had seen the girl talking to a man in a brown vehicle, possibly a Dodge Dart, between 5.30 and 6 that evening. At first, Rochester police dismissed any connection between the two murders. The last would occur nearly seven months later on November 26, 1973, when 11-year-old Michelle Mayanza would never return home from school. Several of her classmates seen her at 3.20 p.m. walking alone, and by 5.30 p.m., she was sighted in a beige or tan vehicle with a flat tire. The driver was observed holding Michelle by the wrist. A man stopped to help with the flat tire and noticed the man pushed Michelle behind him and also obscured his license plate. The man stared menacingly at the Good Samaritan, enough so that the well-intentioned motorist decided to just drive off. Michelle would be found two days later in a ditch. An autopsy revealed that she had trace amounts of hamburger that she had consumed an hour before the murder. Given credence to the reports that a girl matching Michelle's description had been seen in the company of a white man at a restaurant, the man had dark hair and was between 25 to 35 years old and around 6 foot 165 pounds. A composite drawing of the suspect would be released to the media and a reward offered. 200 suspects would be cleared. All three victims vanished on days of light or heavy rain. All three had been fed before the murders, while all three were redressed partially or fully. All three were reported to be loners by schoolmates, as well as coming from a poor family. Although it's known as the Alphabet Murders, most investigators doubt the initials played any role in the murders, and it's just a coincidence. Also, there's some thought that Carmen Cologne's murder was by someone related to her, whereas the other two was by a stranger and was not related to Cologne's case. 50 plus years later, and the case is still unsolved. And Jing Ajak. On the island of Java in Indonesia, lurks an alleged giant werewolf known as Anjing Ajak. According to legend, it has an original human form that transforms into a humanoid wolf that feeds on other people. It is supposed to be very intelligent and very dangerous to anyone who encounters it, for they are known to kill with their claws and teeth. Luckily, a silver bullet is not needed to kill the monster, as in the case with werewolves. A normal bullet to the head or heart is enough to kill the beast. That would be because the name Anjing translates to dog, which means the creature is a were-dog and not a werewolf. This makes more sense as wolves are not native to Indonesia, but wild dogs are. Very little is known about this alleged cryptid, and some believe it's just werewolf lore that was brought over into the colonization period and has mutated to reflect the local wild dogs that inhabit there. Asia Degree This is one of the most famous child abduction cases from the modern era. It's been heavily researched and covered by just about everyone in the true crime genre, so there's nothing I could possibly add that hasn't been stated a thousand times before, but I will give a brief summary. Aisha Degree was a nine-year-old girl who went missing from Shelby, North Carolina on February 14, 2000. It is a bizarre case because she packed her book bag and left on her own accord. She would leave sometime in the early morning hours, sometime after 2.30 a.m., despite the heavy rain and wind the area was seeing that night. Several motorists spotted her. One, a truck driver, even turned around and came back to check on her at which point she was already 1.3 miles away from her home. It was between 3.45 and 4.15 a.m. at this time, and when the driver got closer, she ran off into the woods. It would not be until the next morning that her parents realized she was gone. An intensive search would begin that day, and they found some of the items that she had been carrying when she was last spotted. A year and a half later, her book bag was dug up at a construction site along Highway 18, just north of Shelby. The bag was still packed, and it was in a plastic bag. Strangely enough, the bag now contained items that did not belong to Aisha. And although it seems like Aisha ran away from home, detectives could not find a reason why she would have done so, as she was younger than the typical age that kids run away at. This has led to most investigators to state that it was their belief that she was abducted. What's not clear is if it was a planned abduction, which is why Aisha left the home early that morning to begin with, or if she left for her own reason, and was abducted by someone that happened to drive by. 
The latter seems less likely, as this was around 4 a.m. in a rural area of North Carolina. There's also the possibility that she got lost and succumbed to the elements and her body just hasn't been found yet. The only real lead came in 2016, when the FBI disclosed she may have been seen getting into a dark green early 70s model Lincoln Continental Mark IV or a Ford Thunderbird along Route 18, near where she was seen that night. But considering that lead came 16 years after her disappearance, it's hard to determine how credible the witness account is. As of today, the case remains unsolved. There are no suspects either. At least, none that have been publicly named. Atlas Vampire I've already covered this one in my Halloween video. If you're interested in watching, you can click the little link in the upper right hand corner. Attempted Bombing of Richard Singer On a late evening in Auckland, New Zealand, on July 9, 1937, a prominent lawyer named Richard Singer would jump into a taxi and ask the driver to take him to 122 Grafton Road, which was the address of his home. He had worked a little later than usual that evening, and it was around 6.15 p.m. As they pulled up, the driver would get out to go open the door, but Singer assured him he could manage. He paid the cabbie and made his way up through the gate. A few steps past the gate, Singer would be rocked with a loud explosion, accompanied by a sheet of flame as shrapnel hit the stone wall next to his driveway. The attorney would be thrown several feet, and he sustained multiple injuries. His briefcase and a bundle of documents inside contained several fragments of blue metal. Likewise, his trousers were ripped to shreds. One of the signs on the taxi was also blown off, as well as one of the neighbor's water spouts taking shrapnel. Singer's son and housekeeper would rush outside to see him covered in blood. A doctor was summoned to treat him. He sustained injuries to his face, the calf of his left leg, and the back of his right hand. The hand was struck when it was in upward swing, and it was credited with saving his life. A huge contingent of police would arrive shortly after, but it was dark by then, so the authorities were unable to mount a large search, and they put it off until the next morning. When they were finally able to look, they found debris on several of the neighboring houses. One item of interest found seemed to be a metal canister coated with tar and black sand. The news spread like wildfire, as the Auckland Star called the event, quote, City Bomb Outrage, end quote. People were sucked into the story. It was helped along by Singer himself, who liked to take interviews and speculate on why he was almost killed, along with the fact he was a well-known lawyer, poet, and radio commentator. Some would say he was larger than life. He would spend several weeks in the hospital, having to get surgery to remove a fragment from his thigh. He would eventually get a letter threatening to finish the job. However, it was later determined that it was just a hoax, and not from the original bomber. Detectives were able to deduce the bomb contained pieces of blue rock, as well as they could confirm it was not tripwire activated, nor a time bomb. They would eventually concede that the bomb would have had to have been thrown at Singer. One problem with this, though, was Singer, nor the taxi driver, saw anyone. Three months after the blast, a reward of what amounts to about $6,000 in today's money would be posted for information about the person or persons involved. Nobody came forward. The following year, a boat belonging to a man named Andrew Donovan was damaged by a fire after an explosion. The man told authorities he had also received a threatening letter a few days before that mentioned Singer, but the two men did not know each other. Investigators were not sure the two bombings were connected and the case would go cold. And 80 plus years later, New Zealand authorities still have no idea who was behind the bombing or why. Babes in the Woods The Babes in the Woods murder mystery, not to be confused with the one of the same name in Pennsylvania, is a 70-year-old mystery that comes from Vancouver, British Columbia. The case is about two male victims that were murdered sometime around 1947 and then discovered by a groundskeeper in Stanley Park, Vancouver, British Columbia on January 14, 1953. Police found a hatchet on the scene that was used to kill the boys by striking them in the head. They would also find a woman's shoe on the scene. The bodies had been arranged to lay in a straight line, with each boy's soles facing each other, and finally were covered by a woman's rain cape. The boys were aged between 6 and 10. They also noted that the impact left of the skull was light, indicating that it was more likely a woman than a man that had struck the boys. Investigators had no leads and were never able to establish an identification of the children. The mystery was threefold. Just who were the boys, who murdered them, and why? Part of this would be answered in early 2022, when a woman named Allie Brady would find a family photo of her grandmother Diane with her two brothers that she didn't know existed. 
She was told that the brothers had been taken away by social services and never seen again. The woman would then submit her and her grandmother's DNA to 23andMe and other genealogy sites in an effort to find her missing great uncles. Around that time in 2021, Vancouver police were searching for a DNA match for the Babes in the Woods case. This led the police making contact with Allie Brady's mother in early 2022 to let her know that the Babes in the Woods were her uncles, David and Derek Busquet. Her mom had no idea and had never even heard of the case. Even going back to the early days of the investigation, detectives had believed the mother of the two boys had killed both her two sons and covered them up with her raincoat, then speculated she went off to commit suicide. However, after the DNA was connected, they realized the mother Eileen Busquette had lived in 1996 and died at the age of 78. When detectives looked back over the case notes, they would find that there were early promising leads, but they never led to an arrest. The most promising one came from a woman who claimed to have seen a woman with two kids entering the forest with a hatchet many years prior, only to see this woman coming back out alone screaming with one shoe missing. Of course, a lot of this eyewitness testimony was hard to go by considering it had been so long since the murder. Furthermore, detectives weren't even sure how long ago that it occurred. As I mentioned above, many believed 1947, but some detectives originally thought that it could have occurred as far back as 1944. And although it's not a mystery to me, because it seems that the mother was most likely responsible, her family denies the sweet woman they knew as Granny could have committed the murders. The case is still active. Babushka Lady this is a pretty famous mystery that involved a woman that was present during the JFK assassination. The name comes from the headscarf that she was wearing, which looks similar to a scarf worn by elderly Russian women. It is believed that she was able to either photograph or film the events of that day, and it being in the middle of the Cold War, a potential Russian there recording the assassination. Well, that played out as well as you think it would. Witnesses stated that she was holding a camera as the vehicle went by, as well as documented by film accounts that spot her. She was standing on the grass amongst onlookers. Curiously, in the Mark Bell film, after the shooting, she can still be seen standing with the camera at her face, whereas all the other witnesses had already ducked for cover. After the shooting, she crosses the street and joins the crowd on the grassy knoll. She is last seen in photographs walking east on Elm Street. Neither she nor whatever film photograph she may have taken has ever been identified. And to this day, people have tried to figure out who this woman was. One of the early claims came from a woman named Beverly Oliver. In 1970, she told conspiracy researcher Gary Shaw that she was the Babushka Lady. He claimed that she also told him she gave the undeveloped film to two men identifying themselves as FBI agents. They gave her no receipt, and they never returned the film, even though they claimed she would receive it back in 10 days. Strangely enough, the woman would also state that she never bothered following up. She would stand by these claims for a documentary nearly 20 years later. Most people disregard her claims though. Furthermore, she would claim that she was a witness to some elements of the Martin Luther King Jr. murder, meaning this woman was basically full of it. As for who it could have really been, opinions vary. Some state it was a Russian spy. Some think she was an assassin holding a camera gun. Some think a secret service agent. Of course, you get the typical theory that it was a man dressed up as an older woman, for some reason. Others point out that it may have not been a camera at all, but instead, a pair of binoculars. Baghdad Battery This one is a neat historical mystery, and many of you have probably already heard this one before. But I'm a history buff, and it really intrigues me. The Baghdad Battery is said to be around 2000 years old, being created sometime between 250 BC and 250 AD. The jar was found outside Baghdad, and is made of clay and asphalt. Sticking through the asphalt, is an iron rod surrounded by a copper cylinder. When the jar is filled with vinegar, or any other electrolytic solution, the jar produces 1.1 volts. There is no record of what the jar was used for, but there's a small chance that it was its namesake, a battery. It's been proposed that it was used to electroplate items such as putting a layer of metal onto another layer of metal. Proponents of the battery theory also theorize that it could have been used for something as simple as religious ceremonies. However, this is almost universally rejected by archaeologists, and there's no electroplated item that has been recovered from this period. To further take credence from the battery theory is the ancient alien supporters who claim that some alien race showed up to provide the Parthenians with technology for a battery, for some reason. 
but a more reasonable theory is that it was nothing more than a place to store some sacred scrolls. And until someone can prove otherwise, that will always be the general consensus. Becca. On June 3, 1991, a local truck driver named Eduardo Colon arrived at a Super 8 in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and would check into his room. He requested a room for two, and for one night only, and was expected to check out by 11 the next morning. He gave his info, and it was legit, except for a false vehicle license plate. By June 5th, the hotel had realized that Eduardo never came back to check out. So a security guard would go check the room and found the door locked. He would use a screwdriver to unlock the door. And when he got in, the only thing that stuck out to him was the alcohol bottle sitting on a table. But when he went into the bathroom, he would discover a scary scene. A woman hanging from the shower. It appeared as if she had hanged herself with a suitcase strap. The autopsy would also reveal that she had heroin in her system. It was believed that she had died the day Eduardo had checked in, as she was severely decomposed. A photograph was found in the room, and it was believed to be her. It showed her with another man, who the motel employees identified as Eduardo, sitting in what appeared to be a mall photo booth. The woman had curly strawberry blonde hair and hazel or green eyes. No scars, marks, or tattoos were noted, and she was most likely of Hispanic descent. There was also $500 found in her pocketbook. In addition to the alcohol bottles on the table, was a scale with the name George Martinez written on it. It is thought that this was maybe used to weigh packages of drugs, and since George Martinez was a very common name, no one was able to identify who it could have belonged to. Detectives would spend the next several years trying to track down Eduardo, who they struggled to find in spite of the fact that he had given the hotel his real information. By the time they tracked down his family, they would discover that Eduardo had died several years earlier to natural causes. They would show his family the picture of the couple at the mall photo booth, and the family said it was not Eduardo. They had no idea who the woman was either. Eventually, they would discover that the photo was that of the man whose name was on the scale left in the room, George Martinez, NOM US, the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, were able to track George down and speak to him to try and figure out more about the Jane Doe, because that's the real mystery to this case. Just who is this woman? By 2021, investigators would receive a tip that her first name may have been Becca and that she came from Los Angeles County, specifically Reseda and Simar areas. She had reportedly flew to Albuquerque from LA or Burbank. Her picture has been widely publicized, but no one has ever came forward. One theory behind this is that possibly the family wants nothing to do with it because of the drug trade involved, but it's also possible she already came from a family with whom she did not have good relations with. She could have ran away, and her family never even bothered reporting her missing, and has no idea that she is deceased. The search continues. Bell Gunnis Bell Gunnis was a Norwegian-born American serial killer that killed at least 14 people between 1884 to 1908. Although it's speculated, she could have killed up to nearly 40 people. She immigrated to the United States in 1881 at the age of 22 where she would move to Chicago to live with her sister, who had immigrated several years prior. Belle was a physically imposing woman, standing at least 5'7 and weighing around 200 pounds. She was physically strong and had spent much of her life working on a cattle farm. She also looked masculine, and judging by her pictures, lacked the ability to smile. The shenanigans would begin in 1884, when she married Mad Sorensen. The two would open a candy store, which burned to the ground. That was really bad luck because the couple's home would burn down too. Coincidentally, they were insured for both home and store and got their payouts. Sorensen and his two children, who were also insured, would all die by 1900 in what are suspected poisonings. I won't go over all the murders here because it's just too much and it's discussed in numerous other videos. I would just sum up by saying she remarried another man whose child was most likely murdered by Belle and then himself too being murdered by her. After this, she would start a scam of posting ads in the newspaper looking for love, only to trick the men into bringing money to her, and then she would promptly kill them. So I will bypass all those details and get to the mystery. In April 1908, the Gunnis farmhouse would burn to the ground. In the ruins, the authorities found the bodies of a headless adult woman, who was originally thought to be Belle, along with her three children. In the coming days, authorities would find numerous bodies all over the farm. Belle would be pronounced dead at the scene even though the doctor who performed the post-mortem 
would testify that the headless body was five inches shorter and 50 pounds less than Bell. A Chicago newspaper would float the idea out that Bell had faked her own death and escaped the scene because the noose was tightening. And that could have been right too, as a few of the families were starting to ask questions. Ray Lampier, a hired hand for Bell as well as her part-time lover, would be convicted of arson in connection with burning the house down. He would state that Bell had murdered the new maid, cut her head off, then placed her in bed with Bell's children, then asked Ray to burn the house down as she escaped. I could find no info about what happened to the maid after the fire, but it is documented that she was hired and was seen with gun as days before the fire. In addition, someone had removed almost all the money from Bell's bank account just days before the fire. For years after the fire, numerous sightings in Chicago would be reported to the authorities. The police were able to dismiss every sighting but one, and that one was the last one in 1931, when a woman named Esther Carlson died in LA awaiting trial on charges she poisoned a man for his money. Not only did she look like Gunnis, she was the same age Gunnis would have been, as well as using poison like Gunnis did. To make it even more bizarre, there's no record of Esther Carlson existing before 1908. By 2008, investigators hoped to get DNA from an envelope and stamp sent by Gunnis, but they were too old to get a sample. However, the body in Gunnis' alleged coffin was exhumed, and the height was estimated to be between 5'6 to 5'9, meaning it could certainly really be Gunnis. The only other real proof that it was her was some dental work found in a jawbone that her dentist identified as his work. This has been disputed though. So did Belle Gunnis really get away and live the rest of her life as Esther Carlson? Or did she commit suicide and ask Ray to remove the head and burn the house? Beowulf. I would assume the vast majority of people have heard of Beowulf. It is a very long epic poem and one of the oldest surviving English language stories of all time. For that reason, it is also cited as one of the most important works in the English language. The author is unknown and the date that it was written is heavily disputed, but commonly agreed that it was somewhere between 700 and 1000 AD. In case you don't know, the poem follows our hero Beowulf, a young warrior of the Goths. He goes to help the king of the Danes, who is unable to defend his kingdom from a monster named Grendel. Beowulf kills Grendel, then Grendel's mother in her underwater lair, then brings the treasure back and is crowned king of the Goths. Peace lasts for 50 years before a dragon appears, Beowulf fights the dragon alongside his servant. He then kills the dragon, but dies afterwards. So it's basically your typical fantasy story. The manuscript itself is actually known as the Noel Codex and contains a few other written texts in addition to Beowulf. However, most people just know it by the latter. The manuscript has always been in fragile condition and keeping it preserved over time has proved to be a challenge. In 1731, a fire broke out at the Ashburnham house. Due to this, Portions of the poem are too far gone to be accounted for. Sadly, one of the biggest pieces missing comes from the climatic fight between Beowulf and the dragon. Other missing portions range from full sentences to just missing letters and other minor fragments. Finally, it is believed that Beowulf was passed down orally and written down later on. Because of this, it is impossible to know if the author wrote down everything that was told to him. I'm a bit confused as to why this mystery was on here. I know it's a media mystery but I don't really get it. It's known that parts of the Codex was destroyed by a fire. That's not coming back, so that's not a mystery. I'm not really sure about this one, and I couldn't find the info. Maybe someone will know more in the comments below. Bermeja. Now this is an interesting one to me. Bermeja is a phantom island that allegedly sits somewhere on the north coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. The island was documented on several maps of the Gulf of Mexico from 16th to the 20th century. However, a 1997 survey of the area did not find the island, nor did a more extensive search in 2009 conducted by the National Autonomous University of Mexico. The island was first mentioned in 1539 by Alonso de Santa Cruz on a list called the Yucatan and Adjacent Islands. Its precise location would be given a year later by Alonso de Chavez, who stated that from a distance, the small island looked, quote, blondish or reddish, end quote. By 1844, British maps would start documenting that the island had sank 60 fathoms below the water. The island came back into the spotlight in 2008 when it was officially listed as missing. This caused issues for Mexico because if the island didn't exist, 
the United States zone of control for rights of oil in the Gulf expanded further. This has led to conspiracy theories that the CIA destroyed the island and sunk it to the bottom of the sea, expanding the economic zone allotted to the US. Of course, I'm not sure how they could do that and not get caught. And besides, there's more believable theories out there. The most likely is that early cartographers just made a mistake. This was known to happen, as explorers sometimes misidentify low-laying clouds as islands. It's also possible that someone put the fake island on the map to prevent forgeries. There's also the possibility of shifts in the geography of the ocean floor and rising sea levels. The island may have really existed and just sank to the bottom of the sea, as the British suggested nearly 200 years ago. But that 2009 survey conducted by the National Autonomous University of Mexico stated that not only was there no island at the coordinates recorded previously, they were also able to determine that no such island could have existed in that location for at least 5,000 years. Bigfoot. I don't really know how this one made it to the second layer. I thought everyone knew about Bigfoot. Bigfoot, aka Sasquatch, is a purported ape-like creature said to inhabit the forest of North America. The cryptid has several variations, such as the skunk ape reported to be living in the southeastern US, the Yeti in the Himalayas, and the Yowie in Australia. The debate over if they exist or not has went back and forth for decades. The vast majority of the scientific community dismissed these claims. They claim that it's mostly folklore or misidentification of animals, such as bears, escaped apes, or even humans. They point out to the fact that tales of the creature existed in every culture of the world for centuries. And the proof for Bigfoot? Well, it hasn't been that great. There's a lot of anecdotal claims. There's video and audio, as well as photographs, and cast of large footprints. And several of these are admitted hoaxes, making the case for Bigfoot's existence even harder to believe. I won't go into the description or the lore of Bigfoot too much, just because Bigfoot is probably the most famous cryptid. He's even made it into pop culture, so you most likely already know the details. But I will share some things you may not know. According to Live Science, over 10,000 Bigfoot sightings have been documented in the U.S. About a third of those are in the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, as well as up into Canada and British Columbia. The majority of these sightings were confirmed as mistakes or hoax. The most popular piece of evidence for Bigfoot is the Patterson-Gimlin film. While a lot of experts claim the film is a hoax, many others tend to believe that it's genuine proof. Or at the very least, they say it's hard to dismiss as a hoax. Since this is so widely known, I will just leave it up to you, the listener, to decide. You can let me know if you think Bigfoot exists or not in the comments below. Brain in a Vat Another Philosophical Mystery the brain in a vat is a scenario used in a variety of thought experiments. It's found in many science fiction stories, where the mad scientist, or machine, or bad guy, etc., remove a person's brain, put it in a life-sustaining liquid, then connect the brain to a supercomputer, which would provide it with electrical impulses identical to what a brain normally receives. The computer would then send signals to the brain to simulate reality, such as walking and the brain would continue to experience normal conscious experiences, even though it was just sitting in a vat of liquid. This opens up the question, if a brain in a vat can be sent signals saying that it is in a skull walking down a street, and not be able to tell that it's sitting in a vat versus sitting in a skull, then how can someone know if their beliefs may be true or not? Because since our brains are not able to notice if it is suspended in this liquid, being fed electric signals simulating reality, then what we see and believe now could be completely false. Since it's impossible to rule that out, there cannot be grounds for believing anything we may believe, leading to a greater question of what knowledge really is. This is similar to Plato's allegory of the cave we discussed in an earlier video. The main argument against this is that once a brain is removed from the body, the biology changes, and the brain in the vat scenario simply cannot replicate that biology. Meaning the brain in the vat couldn't even experience the same things that a real brain could. There's a lot more debate that goes back and forth over this, but since it gives me brain drain, I will move on. Butcher of Mons On March 22nd, 1997, police officer Olivier Mott would climb onto his horse and begin patrol across the city of Mons. That day, he would make a frightening discovery. He would find eight garbage bags containing human remains in the small town of Quesmes in Belgium. The eight bags contained body parts from three different people, all of them women. Over the next two days, 
two more bags would be found. And another three weeks later, a final two bags would be discovered. A total of five different victims found in ten different bags through the Mons region of Belgium and northern France would be the final tally. All women and all believed to have been committed in 1996 and 1997. The victims were as follows. Carmelina Russo, who was 42, and remains were discovered in France. 43-year-old Martine Bone, who was from France, but remains found near Mons. 33-year-old Jacqueline Leclerc, a mother of four. 21-year-old Natalie Goddard, and 37-year-old Begonia Valencia, who vanished in her home in 1997. One unusual fact about these victims was that none of them were involved in sex work. Only Martine Bone, who had been a prostitute several years earlier, it seemed the killer did not target sex workers, as is quite common among serial killers. In spite of the fact that the killer was brazen enough to just leave the bags in plain view on the side of the road or in a canal, police had little to go on. A task force would be set up early on to investigate, but due to the lack of staff available, the investigation went nowhere. Part of this fell into the legality of jurisdictions, as Belgium viewed the matter as a local crime to be investigated by the Mons authorities only, while some of the crimes took place in France. Over the years, there have been several suspects, but there's never been enough evidence to arrest anyone. One of these was a 67-year-old man named Smell Tulja. He would be arrested in 2007 in Montenegro at the behest of the United States who was seeking him for the murder of his wife in New York in 1990, to which he was linked by a DNA, as well as being caught red-handed trying to dispose of the garbage bags. It was because of this that he hid in Belgium under a fake name and survived on money his kids sent from the States. I found mixed reports about exactly where he was living in Belgium during this time. Some say Mons, some say about 120 miles from Mons, meaning he probably wasn't the butcher while others cite that his location was unknown. He was also wanted in Albania for two murders at the time. By 2009, he would be formally charged. However, Montenegro refused to extradite him, and he would be sentenced in 2010 to 12 years in prison. He would die just two years later. And the deputy public prosecutor would eventually state there was zero links between him and the Mons Butcher. Another interesting angle that detectives never pursued really hard was that it was someone connected with NATO. As a NATO base was nearby, and troops are rotated in every two years, this would be the exact time range that the murders occurred. It would also be why the suspect was long gone. Between 1997 and 2013, nearly 1,500 leads were followed, but until this day, the suspect or suspects remain unknown. Camera Heads This is a now resolved lost media mystery that featured a creepypasta posted to 4chan's Paranormal Board, also known as X. The first verifiable date that it was posted came on August 8, 2009, although there are claims that it was posted in 2008. The story involved a person who discovered a pile of rocks, a mini-DV video cassette, and a torn envelope, with signs of a struggle in the area. The cassette would then be uploaded to YouTube by the person, who would then go silent. The op stated, quote, I was walking home through a nearby gully and came across a weird sack of rocks and a torn envelope with some writing on it. It appeared to have been written in charcoal or ash. It said, I killed a camera head. On the next line, it took Trevor. And the last line, get help if I don't come back. And there was a mini DV nearby. This was all that was on it besides static, though I had to watch it a few times before I found this clip. Who took this video? A camera head sounds really silly if it's a monster with a camera for a head, end quote. It would go on to be the very first creepypasta detailed on X's wiki called Xenopedia, following its establishment in 2009. However, Xenopedia would eventually shut down, taking with it the only screenshots of the camera head's creepypasta. But by October 19th, 2020, Lost Media Wiki user Maimon005 would rediscover the original creepypasta in the recent changes sections of Xenopedia by way of an archive site. It contained the full transcript and marks this lost media as resolved. Cannibal Holocaust Piranha Scene Cannibal Holocaust may be the most controversial movie in history. It was an Italian horror film from 1980 that was in the found footage genre. 
It was about a crew who went missing filming a documentary about local cannibal tribes. A rescue team would go in to find them, but will only find tapes of the crew's demise. The film would achieve notoriety from its graphic violence, sexual assault, and real violence towards animals. He would even be investigated for being a snuff film, which they were found innocent of. He was banned in many countries right from the get-go. And although some countries would eventually lift the ban, it's still banned in several. The movie in itself has its own mythology and mysteries, but the most sought after one is the lost piranha torture scene. He consisted of a tribesman tying one of their own to a log and then dipping him into a piranha infested river. When he emerges, the meat eating fish have almost completely eaten his leg while some of the fish remain hanging onto the man's limb. The director of the movie has always said the scene did not exist as they couldn't make it work. So instead they used the picture for the publicity. Film historian Callum Waddell has been searching for the answer for years. It would find one of the native actors that starred in the film 40 years ago. That man's name was Renato Blanca, and he had never seen the film, and he would watch it with Callum. It's here he would ask, quote, what happened to the piranha scene, end quote. He would go on to say that they had hired a local guy who had lost his leg and stitched live piranhas to a prosthetic that pulled the man out of the water and he lost his fake leg. He would state that it took a whole day to film the scene. Not very interesting to me, but the lost media community still hopes to find it. Celebrity number six. In January 2020, a Reddit user named Tontash went to the tip of my tongue subreddit to ask a question about a famous person on his curtain. Numerous answers would come forth, but none were an exact match. The question should have been simple, and most people, when they first look at it, they think, I've seen this person, but then they can't think of the name. There have been over 200 names come up in connection with this person on the celebrity curtain, but where did this curtain come from exactly? Redditor Tontash would claim that he bought the curtain in 2008 at a store in Finland. Every other celebrity on the curtain had been identified, and it ranges from Jessica Alba, Orlando Bloom, Josh Holloway, to many others. All the photos were taken between 2003 and 2007. There are many theories about who this mystery celeb is. One stated that the picture was a celebrity wearing a VIP pass or backstage pass around her neck. He also remembered she had dark blonde hair. Of course, others suspect alternative theories. Some wonder if it's a celebrity at all, but instead, maybe it was a random attractive person who a paparazzi accidentally captured in a photo. One theory that is real viable though, states that if you look carefully on the right side of the picture, you see what might be a watermark. This could be why the distributor of the curtain will not release details about the item. It's just possible the designer did not have permission to use the licensed image. But with that being said, someone must know who this is, right? As of now, the answer is still no. Although in 2021, more and more people have started to believe it could be Canadian actor Taylor Kitsch. But what do you think? Charles Peck Phone Calls In 2008, 49-year-old Charles Peck would aboard a Metrolink commuter train heading towards Los Angeles. He was set to meet with his fiancée, Andrea Katz, who was to pick him up at the train station. But the Metrolink commuter would tragically crash, injuring 135 people and killing another 25 more. Peck was one of these people. Meanwhile, Peck's fiance Andrea, who was en route to the train station, would hear of the commuter crash breaking over the news on the radio. At first, she feared for Peck, until she received a phone call from him. She felt relieved at seeing his number go across her phone display. But when she answered it, she was met with static. But it didn't just happen to Andrea. Peck's son, sister, brother, and stepmother all received phone calls from him up to several hours after he had passed. In all, about 35 calls over 11 hours would be made to family and friends after the crash. The final call came at 3.28 a.m., just about an hour before his body was found. In fact, it was these calls that allowed rescue workers to own in on Peck's location. They had originally began the act of recovering bodies when they realized no one else would be alive, but the phone calls breathed the hope that maybe Peck in spite of how bad the crash was, survived. But after they discovered his body in the debris, they quickly determined that he had not survived the impact of the crash, leaving the question, how did the phone calls get placed? One theory was that the crash damaged Peck's phone. 
Or it was even possible that something from the crash landed on his phone, causing it to make random calls. It could have even landed on speed dial or recent calls, causing it to call the people he called the most over and over. But even the more mysterious thing about this whole affair was rescue workers were never able to find his phone. They searched Peck's body and the surviving wreckage, but the phone was never found. Perhaps it shattered into tiny pieces, causing the phone to dial out randomly until the battery died. Or maybe, just maybe, Peck took it to the afterlife with him. Chicago Tylenol Murders Another well-known one here. On September 29, 1982, Mary Kellerman, 12 years old, of Elk Grove Village, just 20 miles outside of Chicago, would die after taking a capsule of extra strength Tylenol. This would be followed by Adam Janus, 27, dying later in the hospital that day after ingesting Tylenol, along with his brother Stanley, 25, and sister-in-law Teresa, 19, who all took Tylenol from the same bottle. But the deaths were not over. Over the next few days, Mary McFarlane, 21, Paula Prince, 35, and Mary Rayner, 27, would all die under the same circumstances and were all located around the Chicago area. It was at this point that authorities were able to connect the deaths to the famous headache medicine. Warnings would be issued throughout the media, as well as patrols using loudspeakers telling people to not use the medicine. Upon investigation, it was found that all of the Tylenol in the area came from Pennsylvania and Texas. Detectives quickly deduced that the product was almost certainly tampered with after shipment. The main hypothesis being that someone went into local stores took the bottles off shelves, placed potassium cyanide in some capsules, then placing the packages back to the store shelves, only to be purchased by unlucky victims. During the investigation, a man named James William Lewis would eventually end up being arrested after he sent a letter to Johnson & Johnson demanding a million dollars or he would not stop the poisonings. After he was caught, it was determined that he had no connection to the poisonings and that he was only trying to take advantage of the fear and extort the company. He would eventually be sentenced to 10 years in prison. However, in 2009, court documents would be released showing, quote, Department of Justice investigators concluded Lewis was responsible for the poisonings, despite the fact that they did not have enough evidence to charge him, end quote. By 2010, Lewis and his wife would both submit DNA samples and fingerprints to the authorities. And as late as September 2022, new life would be breathed into the case. As former Illinois State Police Director Jeremy Margolis would state, quote, Obviously, a lot is going on about which I can't comment, but there is a renewed interest in this case, end quote. Journalists would learn from sources close to the investigation that old circumstantial evidence and unidentified newly obtained evidence have brought authorities back around to looking at Lewis again. Former Chicago Federal Prosecutor Gil Soffer would state, quote, I think it could be a, let's give it our best shot, there seems to be enough there that this could go to trial, and I would not be surprised if that's the decision." End quote. Lewis, for his part, has stuck to the same story he has given for 40 years, which usually means that person is telling the truth. But with rumors heating up, could we finally see him charged soon? Christine Shields Wagner On October 10, 2016, Christine Wagner would leave her residence in Olympia, Washington. The 67-year-old was last seen getting into her 2004 Toyota Matrix and driving off. This was the last time she would ever be heard from. Family and friends had no idea where her destination was. They would call authorities pretty quickly, as they were worried due to Wagner's previous attempts at self-harm. Inside her home, detectives would find her purse with all of its contents left behind. Further complicating matters is the fact that Christine, or someone else, turned her phone off after she disappeared. Her car would be found two weeks later at Harmony Farm Conservation Easement on Johnson Point Road in Olympia. This is probably the most obscure missing persons case we've came across yet on this iceberg because what I just read to you is literally all that's known about the case, at least publicly anyways. I wish there was more info available to share, but there's just not. But even though there has been nothing stated publicly, the most likely scenario is Christine either chose to disappear or chose to end her life. Cleveland Torso Murderer on September 23, 1935, the lifeless body of a man named Edward Andresy would be discovered at the foot of Jackass Hill. Yeah, that was the real name. His head, which had been decapitated, was discovered buried near the body. The victim also had rope burn around his wrist, as well as being emasculated. Even more gruesome 
was the fact that Edward had not been beheaded after the murder. The medical examiner instead ruled that his death was caused by the decapitation. The murderer would be the first discovered victim of the official 12 Cleveland Torso murders, called so because the suspect would often dismember his victims, as well as beheading them. And just like with Andresy, he would choose to behead them while they were still alive. The men were almost always castrated as well, and some of the victims were burned by some chemical treatment, which left their skin red and leathery. Out of the 12 official victims, only three were identified, leaving five John Doe's and four Jane Doe's. And although there were 12 victims officially from 1934 to 1938, some investigators link up to as many as 20 to the Cleveland Torso murderer. One of these is the infamous murder victim known as Lady of the Lake, who was never positively confirmed as a victim of the Torso murderer, in spite of the fact that she was beheaded and had chemical burns on her skin. If 100% confirmed, she would have been the first victim. Another interesting victim was a man named Robert Robertson, who was found beheaded in 1950, nearly 20 years after the original murders. The investigations were incredibly difficult, as forensic science was still in its infancy. Making it more difficult was the heads were often never found, but maybe the most difficult part in catching the killer was the fact that most of the victims were drifters. It was hard to nail down a suspect when victims themselves were almost ghosts. This was in the Depression, and the victims were seen as lower-class individuals, making them easy prey for a cruel suspect. Detectives would interrogate over 9,000 people during their investigation. This would lead to two serious suspects. The first would be eventually posthumously exonerated in 2010. So that leaves us with one suspect. And he is a hell of a suspect. That man was Dr. Francis E. Sweeney. To start, Sweeney was a World War I vet, where he served as part of a medical unit. That unit would often conduct amputations in the field, giving Sweeney the knowledge to have made those precise dismemberments that the torso murderer made. During the war, Sweeney would be gassed in combat, and this led to nerve damage. This probably attributed to the PTSD that he had after the war, which directly led to him becoming an alcoholic. The famous Elliot Ness, who helped bring down Al Capone, was the Cleveland Public Safety Director at the time, and although his role was largely limited in this investigation, he was fully convinced Sweeney was the man. He even personally interrogated him. When brought in for questioning, Sweeney was so hammered that they had to give him a few days to sober up. Sweeney would fail two lie detector tests, which we know are largely junk science, and Ness felt that the chances of prosecution were slim, since Ness's political rival, a U.S. congressman, was a cousin to Sweeney, and could possibly use his political power to save his cousin. There was also very little evidence linking Sweeney, as it was too circumstantial to be prosecuted on. Sweeney himself would be committed to a psychiatric hospital after becoming a suspect, and the murders would stop. Well, stop depending on if you believe the Robert Robertson murder was conclusively linked to the torso murder. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and spent the remaining years of his life sending taunting letters to Elliot Ness. So do you think it was Sweeney, or someone else altogether? Connecticut River Valley Killer In 1985, in Kellyville, New Hampshire, Claremont police would be alerted to a set of remains located in the woods. Upon looking at the body, the medical examiner was able to determine the victim was a woman, and she had died by multiple stab wounds. She had most likely been sexually assaulted as well. While they were in the midst of their investigation, however, they would receive word from a town about 30 miles south, that of Saxton's River, Vermont, as someone had broken into a 36-year-old Linda Moore's home and stabbed her to death. Ten days after this attack, Detectives back in Claremont would discover another set of remains in the woods, this one sitting within a thousand feet of the first one. Detectives would soon trace the remains of both victims, one being 17-year-old Bernice Cordamatch, who disappeared on May 30, 1984, after hitchhiking to her boyfriends, and 27-year-old Ellen Fried, who disappeared on July 22, 1984, after stopping to use a payphone. Both had died by multiple stab wounds. Detectives now feared the worst and would go back and look at unsolved murders from the previous years. They would find two that matched the MO, the dump sites, and the specific wound pattern. One was 27-year-old Kathy Milliken that was murdered on October 24, 1978, when she was out taking photographs of birds at a wetland preserve. She had been stabbed 29 times, and 37-year-old Mary Elizabeth Critchley, who disappeared on July 25, 1981, when she had been hitchhiking. The reason for her death could not be determined. By the following year, in 1986, one more body, that of Eva Morse, 
a 27-year-old single mother, would be found by loggers just 500 feet from where Critchley's body had been found. She had several knife wounds to her neck. The last official murder contributed to the River Valley Killer happened on January 10, 1987, when 38-year-old nurse Barbara Agnew was returning home and pulled into a rest stop in Hartford, Vermont. Her car would be discovered with the door cracked open and blood on the steering wheel. Her remains would be found a couple of months later. This was not the last official attack, however. As Jane Borowski is believed to be the only one who survived the maniac's attack, the pregnant 22-year-old stopped at a store on August 6, 1988 to buy a soda from a vending machine. A man would exit a Jeep Wagoneer and approach her. He would ask her if the payphone was working before pulling her out of the car and stabbing her 27 times. He would drive off thinking that she was dead. She was able to get back into her car and drive to her friends, who helped her in and called an ambulance. The murderer would actually drive by and see this taking place and drove off. He never killed again, at least that police know of. There are five other victims, ranging from 1968 to 1989, that are thought to be possible victims of the Valley Killer, but none are 100% confirmed. There was one description of the man, coming from Linda Moore's murder. He was slightly stocky, dark-haired man with a blue knapsack, thought to be between 20 and 25, clean-shaven, somewhat round face and wearing dark rim glasses. All the murders were similar too. All of them were committed by a knife, except for Critchley's. Four of them had a specific stabbing pattern across the upper body and abdomen. The other cases may have had the same pattern, but the bodies were too decomposed to tell for sure. All but two of the victims were killed in a wooded area they had been transported to. Two murders, Moore and Borowski, were thought to have been interrupted. Two sets of the victims were found in the same area. Three of the victims were hitchhiking, Two of the attacks involved a payphone and were near a soda machine. It was thought that the man may have serviced vending machines in the area. It's also a commonly held theory that the man was targeting health care workers as two nurses and one nursing aide was among the victims. The case remains unsolved. Contents of the Library of Alexandria Great Library of Alexandria was one of the largest and most significant libraries to ever exist. It was part of a larger research institution called the Malcian which was dedicated to the goddesses of literature, science, and arts. The Universal Library was most likely proposed by Demetrius of Phelerum, an exiled Athenian statesman living in Alexandria, but the library itself was not constructed until Ptolemy II of Philadelphus. The library would quickly acquire many papyrus scrolls, mainly due to the Ptolemaic king's aggressive nature at procuring various texts. Contrary to popular belief, the Library of Alexandria did not burn down, Instead, it declined gradually over the course of several centuries. There were also rulers who would purge intellectuals, prompting many responsible for the library to flee to other nations. Part of the library did accidentally get burned by Julius Caesar during the Roman Civil War, but it's unclear how much damage was done. The library further dwindled during Roman control, as there wasn't much funding or support for it. The library was thought to have been fully destroyed at the latest by 270 AD, but the mystery here is, just what knowledge was stored at the library? What was lost? Unfortunately, there's no real way to know. It's not even known how many different scrolls were stored at the library, but there's a rough estimate that it was between 40,000 to 400,000 at its height, or about the equivalent of 100,000 books, which would have taken an enormous amount of storage space. Making it even more difficult to guess was the fact that one piece of writing could take multiple scrolls, these would be broken down into self-contained books by an editor. There was an index created by Kelly Macus, who was one of the librarians. The catalog was created around 306 BC, but since few fragments exist, it's impossible to take anything from it. We do know his system broke the scrolls down into six genres and five sections, that being rhetoric, law, epic, tragedy, comedy, lyric poetry, history, medicine, mathematics, natural science, and miscellaneous. But how much of this was really lost? One interesting thing to remember in all this, it was not the only library in ancient times. There were many. There were so many that anything of note that was lost from the Library of Alexandria would have been stored somewhere else. So in all likelihood, nothing of real value was lost. What was lost, however, would have been the commentaries by the hundred or so researchers and librarians that lived at the library full time. Their thoughts on other authors, books, as well as their catalogs, such as the aforementioned index by Callimachus, would all be lost. 
Regardless, whatever was lost will most likely never be recovered. Corpse Quakes In an edition from the Cincinnati Enquirer dated February 11th, 1889, an article would discuss a rare mental affliction known as corpse quake. The alleged mental disorder is known to have existed only among grave diggers, and amongst those diggers, only those that had been digging for several years. It was known to be not so uncommon to the diggers themselves. The main symptom of someone with corpse quake is the involuntary shaking that comes from it. One digger was quoted as saying, quote, I know of a number of such cases. Ten years ago, we had three diggers here who had worked together for quite a while. One of the three used to be a very lively chap and always willing to tell a good yarn, became very quiet all at once. His companions noticed this and thinking that Joe was not feeling well, let him alone. There was to be a funeral in the afternoon and we went over to dig the grave. As soon as Joe stuck his spade in the ground, he began to shake. His companions told him to stop working if he didn't feel well. But Joe paid no attention and continued his work until the job had been finished. Three or four more graves were made that day, and every time Joe put down his spade, he shook. The other two tried to make fun of him by imitating his shaking while at work. A few days later, Joe's companions had the corpse quake too, and a week later, had to stop work entirely. He continued, I thought that the three men had contracted malaria, but strange to say, they never would have that peculiar shake while away from the cemetery. Joe came back to us, but every time he would pick up a spade and try to work, the old trouble would come back. We insisted upon giving up the job as he was falling away. He remained at home for about a week, and his wife told us Joe was getting better again, when one day his boy mentioned the word spade in his father's presence. It was the strangest thing in the world. No sooner had the boy said spade than Joe took the corpse quake again. He didn't last long after that. He would be thinking about digging graves all the time, and this made him so sick that he died shortly after. I don't remember what became of the other two men. They had to give up the job, and I think moved away from here altogether." End quote. This is the one and only account of the affliction that I could find, which was documented by Chris Woodyard on her blog, thevictorianbookofdead.wordpress.com. So with no other info available about the case, I'm not sure this was some kind of mental disorder or a tall tale. Cosmic String You know I hate mysteries like this, but I will attempt to power through it regardless. Cosmic String not to be confused with string theory, are hypothetical topological defects which may have formed in the early expansion of the universe. The simplest comparison I could find, it's just like cracks that form when water freezes into ice. It's theorized that, just like the ice, these imperfections happen as the universe began to form, and the imperfections continue to grow along with the universe. So basically, they are a crack or a defect in the universe. These defects would be impossibly thin, but being that thin, a stretch of cosmic string only a mile long would weigh more than the Earth. The reason that it's a mystery is because if cosmic string does exist, it would be a possible means of time travel. These hypothetical strings may weave throughout the entire universe, thinner than an atom and under immense pressure, so that means they could have quite a gravitational pull on anything passing near them. It would enable objects attached to the string to travel at incredible speeds, and pulling two strings close together would possibly warp time space enough to create a closed time-like curve which would allow a time traveler to journey into the future but arrive in its past. It's also been proposed a spaceship could propel to the past by looping around cosmic strings. However, cosmic strings are highly speculative. Dale Williams, a pretty famous missing person case here, and you all probably already know the details of it. He was on Unsolved Mysteries, as well as Kadabra doing an excellent video on it. So I'll try to be brief. On May 27, 1999, 43-year-old Dale Williams in Nucla, Colorado would fail to make it home for dinner. His wife of 23 years, Diana, assumed he was staying over at the auto shop he owned working on something. By bedtime, Dale still had not arrived. Diana would start to get concerned. She would call the shop a few times, but he never answered. By 10 p.m., she went to bed. She would eventually wake at dawn and was horrified to discover he had not made it. Scared, she would drive straight to the garage. It was here that she found it unlocked. She found the van he was working on with the hood up. The tools lie around, as if he had stepped away only for a minute. She would go back to check with his mother, who also had no idea where he was. Eventually, Diane and his mother Ida 
would start to search the local junkyards, followed by just driving around looking for him, but there was no sign of Dale. Diane at this point would call the police. They would come out and quickly start putting together his day. They would find one person that seen Dale before he vanished was Pastor Tom Ross. He was in the body shop that morning. He stated that Dale received a phone call from someone who was broken down on a remote stretch of highway, about three quarters of a mile east of a store in Bedrock, Colorado. Tom thought the caller was a female, but was not sure. Tom also stated the caller was not alone, but was in a panic. Dale was going to take a tow truck, but the caller requested that the vehicle be jumped or something else minor like that. Considering Dale did body repair and was not a mechanic, the call was unusual. Even more bizarrely, Dale would make a stop on his way to help to visit a customer named Tammy. She would state that Dale come by her office at 12.15 to inform her that he couldn't repair a windshield until the following week. She thought it was strange for him to drop by when he could have just called. She also mentioned that Dale was in a hurry and told her that he was on his way to help a stranded motorist. Missing posters were printed and put up by family and friends, and two days later all the posters were gone, so more posters were put up. These two would be taken down. Detectives would eventually put a hidden camera to capture who was tearing down the posters. Incredibly, it was a former friend of Dale and Diana. Turns out, about a year prior, Dale and Diane had helped the man's ex-wife move to another state without his knowledge. The man was angry at Dale for this, especially when Dale refused to tell him where she moved to. A month after helping her move, Dale would start to find some disturbing items outside his body shop, like torn pictures of him and Diane and the now ex-couple in happier times. He would also find 22 caliber bullets scattered across the ground. Diane would also find a 22 caliber revolver and a night drop box at a video store she ran. All these items had been stolen from Dale's shop. Police would interview the friend, and of course he denied all of it. Six weeks after Dale's disappearance, his truck would be located in a river. It was determined that someone had deliberately steered it into the water. Police were never able to find Dale's body or the person that made the phone call. Generating more speculation was the fact that a few witnesses placed Dale's truck in its normal spot at 1.30 the day that he vanished. If true, Dale or someone else drove his truck back into town within 90 minutes of responding to the call that he received. Other witnesses stated that they seen Dale around 5 to 6 p.m. that evening, purchasing a soda at a grocery store in the neighboring town. Over 20 years later, and Dale is still missing. Darwin Scott Darwin Scott was a murder victim whose case was never solved. But what really makes this case stick out was he was none other than Charles Manson's uncle. On May 27th, Darwin was found stabbed to death in his Ashland, Kentucky home. There were reports that his body was pinned to the floor with a butcher knife, having been stabbed up to 19 times. The mystery ties in here. It appears that the Ashland Police Chief, Lewis Mutters, stated that he was investigating the possibility that Manson and his followers may have been responsible, as there were several local residents claiming to have seen a man resembling Manson in the area of the day of the murder. A lot of this ties back to a group of hippies living in the area at the time, led by a man referred to as Preacher. The group was known to give out LSD to the young people in town, while also offering the promise of sex and the community lifestyle, such as life in the 60s. Could this man have been Manson? And for Darwin Scott himself, he wasn't an angel. He had a rap sheet a mile long, mostly for gambling, burglary, making moonshine, and forgery. He assuredly made several enemies, and it just as easily could have been one of them responsible. Manson, on the other hand, would have had to drove from California to Kentucky, back to California, all in 10 days. Not impossible, but very unlikely. However, Manson's parole officer did state that he had not heard from Manson the entire 10 days that the murder occurred in. And as for motive, Darwin was known to keep a large stockpile of money in his home. So was this a Manson murder, or was it someone else? David Chase This is another fairly famous unsolved murder case that was documented on Unsolved Mysteries in the late 90s. According to the story, a private detective named Phil Harris would take a nap in his easy chair when a bizarre thing happened. A voice came to Phil as he was asleep. The voice said, quote, I'm David Chase. I was murdered. I want you to investigate my murder. By the Sunday paper. End quote. Although Phil thought it was crazy, he couldn't shake it from his mind. So he went and got a paper early that morning. Phil would discover that David Chase was a local cabinet maker who had drowned four months earlier. His wife, Judy, 
had been trying to convince law enforcement that he had been murdered, Phil would contact Judy and say he felt that he had been chosen to solve the case. He would then meet with Judy, who was obviously skeptical, and he would relay things to Judy about David that only she could know. Phil would offer a deal. He would work the case for her for the total sum of a dollar. With a deal like that, she couldn't refuse. So Phil would begin to track and cover David's whereabouts on June 6, 1995. He would find that he worked with a friend named Matt Orahosk on a roofing job. They would go to lunch, then to the bank where David cashed an $1,800 check, followed by going to the bar. When David did not return that night, Jody became concerned. She would go to his friend Matt's, who said he had left him at the bar. However, Matt's girlfriend would contact her later that morning and tell Judy that when she had asked Matt about David, he would say that David had told him he was going for a swim because he had a raft, which was bizarre. And it didn't make sense that Matt hadn't mentioned it before. So understandably, Judy no longer trusted Matt and went to the police. The police would interview Matt later that day and Matt would relay basically the same story. He stated that David unloaded tree limbs from Matt's truck and jumped into the creek next to the bar and told Matt to pick him up in Morrison. It would be six weeks later when David's body was found three miles downstream. The medical examiner confirmed that David had died by drowning. However, there are some things that didn't add up. For one, the autopsy revealed David was not drunk, in spite of drinking all day. David also had a broke neck and unusual cuts on his legs. Also, every bit of clothing except for his shoes and socks were missing. Detectives would interview Matt again, and he changed a couple of details. He now stated that David fell into the river when they were dumping brush, but that accident didn't make sense because the fire station was right where he said David fell in, and he could have gotten help quickly. Now back to the Phil Harris part of the story. You know, the detective that heard David's voice. He would state that the voice also told him that Matt had murdered him. After backing out on a deal that saw David paying Matt $1,800 for a truck, he claimed the voice said Matt had hit David with something in the back of the head, breaking his neck. Then Matt and an accomplice cut his jeans off with a knife and tossed him into the river. A week later, Phil would die from a massive heart attack. So we're left with two questions. Did Matt murder David? And did David somehow contact Phil from the other side? David Fortin Around 8 a.m. on February 10, 2009, in Alma, Quebec, David Fortin asked his mother Caroline to drive him to school. His mom, though, was unable to that morning, so he instead put on a warm red jacket and walked towards the bus stop. Caroline would note later on that he had left about 5-10 to 10 minutes earlier than normal, but thought nothing of it. Sadly for Caroline and David's father, Eric, this would be the last time they ever see their son. In fact, David never even got on the bus, but what happened between his home and the bus remains a mystery. David's parents believe it could be related to the relentless bullying he suffered in school. In fact, David's father would state right before he disappeared, he told his father that another student was going to hurt him the next day. Detectives would quickly launch an investigation, but found very little. They did discover there were at least a half a dozen people that saw David hitchhiking south. His parents would also discover that David had packed some clothes the morning he walked out the door, as well as he chose report card day, when the teachers would be distracted, to make his escape. A month later, Surveillance video of the boy would give his family hope. As it appeared that he was boarding a ferry northeast of Montreal, he looked leaner and scruffier, traveling alone and eating a bag of chips. His mom was 95% sure that the boy captured on the video was her son. A detective would state, quote, He doesn't really know where he is going, I'm convinced. He's not someone that spent much time outside his little town. He doesn't know Quebec that well, and he doesn't know the big city. It's all quite worrying, end quote. Years later, a crime journalist named Claude Poirier would state that someone claiming to speak on David's behalf would leave him a message. The message stated David was ready to come back home under certain conditions. One, that no charges be laid against the individual that helped David escape and had been sheltering him, claiming that he would have ended his own life if not for this individual. And two, that David's parents leave Jehovah's Witness and respect his sexual orientation. And finally, that the media let David live a quiet life. David's mother replied through the media statement, quote, If the person took care of David, we thank him rather, because precisely, if that person had not been put on David's path, maybe today we could not talk to each other, end quote. However, she wanted to point out that the family was not part of Jehovah's Witness. She also added that the issue of David's sexual orientation was never discussed before his disappearance, and that it did not pose a problem for her or David's father. After 13 years, thousands of tips and sightings called in, Many proven false. No one knows what happened to David. 
Detectives have stated they know for sure that David ran away, mostly to get away from school where he was being bullied, but they find it hard to believe a 14-year-old from a small town with limited travel experience could have prepared so well to have ran away and succeeded. And on top of succeeding, he's been able to avoid being spotted. So did David really escape on his own? Or did he have someone helping? Did he end his own life? Or did he run into harm during his escape? Was the message left with the crime journalist real or a hoax? Diane Suzuki Diane was a Hawaiian woman that disappeared on July 6, 1985. It has been one of the most notorious modern crimes in the state's history. She was a woman of Japanese descent, and she had a small stature at 4 foot 11, 109 pounds, and a slim build. On the day of her disappearance, she was speaking to a man outside of the dance studio where she was employed at as a dance instructor. After their conversation, she would walk into the building. The man walked the opposite way. At 3 p.m., her dance class ended. A witness seen Diane walk down a hallway, heading to the bathroom of the second floor. The same witness stated that only one other person was in the building, and he was on the second floor as well. The witness never seen Diane come back down, and he left shortly after. Just 15 minutes later, Diane's friends came by to meet her, yet they could not find her. They headed upstairs where they seen she had left her purse and keys. The sole remaining person on the second floor stated Diane had left, but it was noted he was nursing a cut to his finger. When Diane's parents arrived on the scene, they were immediately struck by an odd sight when they seen three people carrying a big trunk out of the building. They would relay this to the detectives. The detectives quickly found out that it was Dewey Hamasaki and his father and sister. Dewey, who was the photographer, quickly became the top suspect. For one thing, everyone knew that he had a huge crush on Diane. More suspiciously was the fact that Dewey had scratches all over him. And it's never been stated officially, but it is believed that he was the person on the second floor with Diane when she went missing. He would be asked to do a polygraph test, to which he failed miserably. Allegedly at this point, Dewey's attorney asked the prosecuting attorney, would he accept a confession in exchange for a manslaughter charge, to which the prosecutor declined. Luminol would be used by the Honolulu Police Department for the first time in history in this case. They would discover bloodstains in the bathroom. However, they could not connect the blood to anyone. Clothes would also be found buried on the ranch that Dewey's family owned. These clothes fit the size and the look of what Diane was wearing that day. Although most believe Dewey was responsible, there has never been any hard proof linking him. There's also been other theories proposed as well. Some people have tried to link her murder to that of the Honolulu Strangler, a serial killer that was never captured. Police dispute this though, and claim that her case is unrelated. Others believe she walked away to start a new life. This theory was largely built on the alleged sightings of her at Disneyland, as well as Tokyo. In 1993, the prosecuting attorney for Honolulu reopened the case, but after thousands of dollars and man hours spent on the investigation, no charges were filed. It was just really hard with no physical evidence and no body to prosecute someone. The case went ice cold after that. I think it's pretty obvious what happened to Diane, sadly. But what do you think? Doodler. The Doodler, aka Black Doodler, was an unidentified serial killer believed to be responsible for at least six, but possibly up to 16 deaths in San Francisco, California, between January 1974 and September 1975. The nickname came because the suspect would make sketches of the men where he met them at a bar or club, then convince them to leave with him. It's here that they would have a sexual encounter before the doodler would then stab them to death. His victims were often stabbed in similar locations on the body. All of the victims were white. Detectives believe the men were killed near the location where they were found. The suspect was a black man between 19 and 25 years old. He was about six foot and slender build. The confirmed victims are as follows. Gerald Cavanagh was the first, 49 years old, and found on the beach in the early morning hours. He had self-defense wounds. 27-year-old Joseph Stevens was found near a lake. Klaus Christman, a German immigrant. His case was unlike the other ones. He was found clothed, and his murder was far more brutal than the others. He was also married with children. Warren Andrews, who was recently identified in January 2022, he was 52. Frederick Kappen, who was 32, and died from multiple stab wounds. His body was one of the only ones that was moved from the murder spot. He was also a Vietnam vet. And finally, Harold Goldberg, a 66-year-old Swedish immigrant found in Lincoln Park. He was slightly different, as he was out of the age range of the serial killer. He is believed to be the last official victim of the doodler. Detectives are almost certain they know who was behind the killings. 
This man was described as a mental patient with a history of sex-related problems. His psychiatrist had even told investigators that the suspect admitted to the brutal slayings during one of his sessions. There's also the fact that they were tipped off to the suspect's license plate. Luckily, in three of the attacks, the victims survived. They could have been witnesses, but these men refused to testify in court because they did not want to come out publicly. One of the survivors was a well-known entertainer. The other was a diplomat, making the likelihood that they will ever speak out is really small. The suspect did cooperate with police in interviews, but has never confessed. He also was never named publicly. And even though police have a ton of circumstantial evidence, they would need one of the survivors to come forward and testify, which isn't likely. The reward for information leading to the arrest is now 200000 Doomsday Stonehenge. Everyone knows about the Georgia Guidestones. Furthermore, everyone should know by now they've been destroyed, way after they were put on this iceberg. But what exactly was it, and what was the reasoning behind it? The Georgia Guidestones in Elbert County, Georgia, were a set of stones put there in 1979 with a set of 10 guidelines in 8 modern languages and 4 dead languages, carved onto dead slabs. There were 10 instructions left on the stones. 1. Maintain humanity under 500 million people. 2. Guide reproduction wisely. 3. Unite humanity with a new language. 4. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. 5. Protect people and nations with fair laws. 6. Let all nations rule internally. Resolving external disputes in a world court. 7. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. 8. Balance personal rights with social duties. 9. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. 10. Be not a cancer on the earth. It is still unknown who is behind the building of the stones. Furthermore, the inscriptions aren't real clear. Some conspiracy theorists think it was there to establish the begins of a totalitarian tribal government. Others believe that it was satanic or the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist. But since the stones are long gone, there's no mystery anymore. Drake and Josh Pilot In another Lost Media mystery, Drake and Josh was a sitcom that ran from January 11, 2004 until August 3, 2007, with a Christmas special appearing on December 5, 2008. Although fans of the show do know of the pilot that aired as the first episode of the series, there is actually a pilot that was recorded two years earlier in 2002. It was made before Nickelodeon picked up the show, not much is known about the pilot, except that it did use the same plot as the first episode of the show. One difference, though, was Walter Nichols, Josh's dad, was originally played by Stephen First instead of Jonathan Goldstein. No one knew about the pilot until Dan Schneider posted a video in 2009 showing Stephen First in the sitcom. By April 16, 2022, Schneider would post a clip compilation of unaired pilot material on his channel, but he didn't state if Nickelodeon has plans to ever release the full pilot. Eisener Man, Der Eisern Man, or translated from German to the Iron Man, is an old iron pillar partially buried in a German forest. It is a rectangular metal bar that sticks out about four feet above ground and is buried about three foot deep. It is currently located at a meeting of trails that were built sometime in the early 18th century, but it is believed to have been at a nearby location prior. It's first documented in 1625, where it was used as a boundary marker but it is believed to have been manufactured much earlier in the late Middle Ages, but for what reason or why is still unknown. Some people claim that it is an out-of-place artifact, as there are no others found in Central Europe. Unfortunately, there's not much known about this mystery. El Fausto On July 20th, 1968, the crew of Miguel Acosta Hernandez and brothers Ramon and El Alberto would set out onto the sea. The men were very experienced sailors, and they knew their boat, yet they disappeared on a calm windless night between El Hierro and La Palma, a route they traveled often. Before they had left, a 27-year-old man asked them to take him along, as he was wanting to return to La Palma because his daughter was sick. They took him free of charge, and would travel the 61 miles to La Palma. They were expected to reach the island by 10 a.m., but they never showed up. Rafael Acosta, owner of the El Fausto, suspected mechanical failure, and sent out another boat to look for them. They found nothing. They would send out an emergency saying that the El Fausto was missing. Ships and planes would search the area, but they did not find the boat until July 25th, five days later, when it was spotted by a British refrigerated ship. They reported that El Fausto's crew were well, but they refused to take a ride back with them to land. The British ship would give them food and fuel and went on their way. 
It's here that the real mystery starts, as no one is quite sure why the men refused to be towed back to land. Some speculate that the crew of the British ship were lying, or at least they knew more than they told. El Fausto would now have a new estimated arrival time, but again, they went missing. And again, a whole new search would begin. By August 7th, hopes would begin to drop, and the search was called off. Two months later, on October 9th, the crew of the Italian ship would report seeing El Fausto near the Tropic of Cancer, in the middle of the ocean, nearly 600 miles from where it was last seen. The first mate would board the ship and go into the engine room below. He would find a dead man who was partially mummified, clutching a transistor radio in the engine room. This was Julio, the man who had asked for a ride back to La Palma. There were no traces of the other men. There were no signs of violence or damage on board. He took some papers from the dead man's notebook to give to Spanish authorities. They then attached a cable to the boat and proceeded to haul it back to Spain. But in the night, the boat suddenly sank, snapping the tow cable in the process. This is one of the more puzzling sea mysteries. The most likely explanation for the El Fausto going off course was mechanical failure. But the fact that they refused help is the real mystery. It's been long alleged that the crew were involved in something secret or illegal. As far as Julio goes, he was probably trying to fix the engine problems where he died. In the notebook was a partial will, and it said, quote, don't ever tell our son what happened to me. You know that God wanted this fight from me. I love you. End quote. As far as what happened to the other men, no one knows. And finally, what caused the boat to snap and sink when it was being hauled? It's thought that it could have been caused by a submarine patrol in the area, or even a large marine creature. Elton and Antana. On August 29th, 1964, the research ship USNS Elton was photographing the sea bottom west of Cape Horn. While taking samples, he would end up taking a peculiar picture. That picture seemed to show a regular antenna-like structure in an upright position at the bottom of the seafloor, some 12,000 feet deep. It has long been used as proof for UFO-related theories, some calling it an extraterrestrial artifact. It was first mentioned just a few months later in December 1964 in the New Zealand Herald, in which it was entitled, quote, Puzzle Picture from the Seabed, end quote. By 1968, Brad Steiger would write an article for Saga magazine claiming the photograph was, quote, an astonishing piece of machinery, very much like the cross between a TV antenna and a telemetry antenna, end quote. Others speculated that it could have simply been a part that fell off a boat, while some claimed that it was a secret Russian project. However, opponents of the fringe theories claim that it is nothing more than an unusual sponge that lives in the ocean. In fact, it had been documented as far back as 1888 in a book called Three Cruises of the Blake. The authors described it as a sponge which, quote, somewhat resembles a space-age microwave antenna, end quote. But I'll leave it up to you, the viewer, to decide. Entombed Animals This is a mystery of animals that have been allegedly found alive after being encased in solid rock, coal, or wood for an indeterminate amount of time. The references have been made as far back as the 16th century. The stories usually feature some workmen digging in a quarry or a mine and they find creatures inhabited in a cavity of a rock, roughly their own size. In 1771, French naturalist Louis Theodore Harissant carried out experiments entombing three toads in plaster cells that were encased in wood. He found two of the three alive three years later. Later on in the 19th century, English geologist William Buckland conducted an experiment to see how long a toad could remain encased in stone. He placed toads of different sizes into carved chambers of limestone and sandstone blocks, and then sealed them with glass covers, then buried them in his garden. A year later, he dug them up, and not surprisingly, discovered most of them were dead. However, a few in the limestone survived, but considering the glass had cracks in it, Buckland believed that small insects had made their way in, and it kept the toad alive. He would rebury them for another year, and this time, they would all die. He would conclude that there was no possible way that a toad could survive in stone and that the reports had to be mistaken. The most likely scenario is that these miners had busted open a rock only to have a frog quickly jump in or accidentally fall into it. In the dark mines, it would have been hard to see happen. And then when they look closer, they see the frog in it and think the frog was there before it busted. This one is a weird one for me and I find it hard that anyone could believe it. But I ask you, the viewer, what your take is. Existence of Aliens This is a debate almost everyone has heard. 
According to Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking, it would be super unlikely for life to not exist somewhere else in the universe. To believe that no life exists elsewhere would be akin to believing that we are nothing but special observers in the universe. Something very difficult to believe. Since the 50s, astronomers have proposed that certain habitable zones around stars are where life is most likely to exist. As of early 2013, only a few planets were found in these zones. But by late November of that same year, astronomers would start using data from the Kepler space mission and found that there could be as many as 40 billion Earth-sized planets orbiting in habitable zones. And this is just based on life as we know it. This doesn't take into account life that may thrive in other conditions. Another thing to consider is that life on Earth is proof of life in the universe. And no matter how small the chance of life was at developing on Earth, the unimaginable scale of space and time make that small chance highly likely that it happens somewhere else. Some would say it's statistically certain life is somewhere else. As for the argument against it, you just have to go back to the Fermi paradox we discussed earlier, which basically states that if life exists elsewhere, statistically, there should be a planet advanced enough that they would have been able to visit here by now. And considering they haven't, and considering that we've never been able to pick up any real tangible proof of signals from space, they most likely don't exist. I'll leave it to you to decide. Exotic matter. There are several proposed types of exotic matter. One being matter that would violate the known laws of physics, or matter that has not been encountered yet, or matter that is theorized to exist but has not yet been proven, and poorly understood matter, such as dark or mirror matter. As for what the mystery is, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure if the author of the iceberg was questioning if exotic matter really exists, or if it does exist, what could it lead to? Something like time travel? or the ability to create wormholes, I'm just not sure. As always, feel free to enlighten me in the comments. First legitimate 3DS SD card hack. This is a lost Screamer video that was uploaded to YouTube by an unknown user. Screamers are now more commonly known as jump scare videos. The word is used to describe any game, video, website, or program that tricks the viewer into concentrating hard on the screen, and then suddenly, they change it in a way to startle the viewer. Most screamers use scary or creepy images and loud sounds and scream to make their goal more effective, hence the name Screamer. This particular lost screamer is a video that starts with a person turning on his Nintendo DS and then launches the Nintendo DS camera program, shortly after pressing the More Pictures button. A flashing image of Jeff the Killer appears with a loud screech. He was apparently pretty popular at one time, but has now been lost. Flight 19 Flight 19 is a famous Bermuda Triangle mystery, where a group of torpedo bombers disappeared on December 5, 1945. They lost contact with the U.S. Navy over water during a training flight from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. All 14 airmen were lost, as well as the 13 crew members that searched for them. Upon an investigation by the Navy, they would conclude that the flight leader, Charles C. Taylor, mistook small islands offshore for the Florida Keys after his compasses stopped working resulting in the flight heading over open sea and away from land. The report was later changed by the Navy to say, quote, cause unknown, end quote, to avoid blaming Taylor for the loss of five aircraft and 14 men. They would also state one of the rescue aircraft went down due to an explosion mid-flight. The most bizarre part of this mystery was the rescue crew that was sent after the bombers. They would radio back to the tower stating they were close to Flight 19's last assumed position. That crew would also disappear and never be heard from again. There has been much conjecture over what happened to the bombers. It is known that the compass on Taylor's aircraft malfunctioned at some time into the flight. This ties back into the long alleged rumors that the Bermuda Triangle has some kind of supernatural phenomenon that causes ships and planes to malfunction and crash. Other experts claim that it was nothing more than pilot error. But I guess the real mystery is, just what happened to Flight 19? And is the Bermuda Triangle really the cause of it? Fluorescent Freddy On March 15th, 1965, a group of several teenagers in a wooded area of French Lake, Indiana, would encounter a Bigfoot-like creature standing 10 feet tall and covered with bright green hair and glowing red eyes. In a somewhat strange turn in the world of cryptids, this is officially the only recorded sighting of this alleged creature, one that seems to be related to Bigfoot. Outside of being mentioned in one newspaper and a few Bigfoot-related books, there's hardly any information on the supposed cryptid, meaning it's most likely false. And that is all for part 4 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. Thanks to all that made it this far.